We are called, called to cast off our former selves, embarking on a journey of grace and love. Our mission is clear, to recognize Christ as the very nucleus of our existence. To crucify our old ways and our earthly desires through kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, and putting on His love daily. We strive not to merely exist, but to live with Christ in and through our lives. This is our calling to live a life that is over and above. Church, if you would please open your Bibles to me to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter four, Colossians chapter four, one more time in the book of Colossians. My name is Matt Brooks. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church of Broken Arrow. Before we study the text this morning, I just wanna give a praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for just the incredible week that we've seen in our church. As Charlie, our student pastor, next-gen pastor, mentioned to you earlier, it's been an incredible week in the life of our students. Many of them fill this middle section now in our 11 o'clock service. 167 total attendees at camp this year. Church, let's give a round of applause for the Lord. Six decisions for Christ this week. Six decisions for Christ. Many of those students will be baptized at the end of the month in our baptism service here at our church. Just an incredible movement of God. And then last week, I gave you an update in regard to where we are in regard to phase one of Greater Still. So many of you have realized that we're meeting in our gym because our worship center is being remodeled and new lobby area and office relocation. And we came to you last week with just an amazing miracle of God and the generosity of his people that, that we have an opportunity to match dollar for dollar the amount that has been given to our church. Church, this past week, as a result of God's grace and your generosity, you have given over $102,000 to completing phase one in one week. So praise the Lord, we're right at approximately $335,000 left to finish phase one. Just praise the Lord for his provision and celebration of God's people. I'm humbled that you and I, after 21 sermons, 21 opportunities that we've had in the book of Colossians, that we will finish this incredible book today by God's grace. I want to remind you that our content team has put together a devotional that walks right alongside this sermon. You can text the word sermon to 45776 as you continue to follow Christ this week and as you continue to finish your study of the book of Colossians. I want to talk to you today about how Christ is enough. Paul, in the last verse of Colossians, Colossians 4.18, is going to summarize the entire book. And so what I want to do is that we, as we study this book, I want to remind you how Paul has began to conclude his series of lessons through the book of Colossians. Paul is going to climactically and warm-heartedly conclude his writings. And he's done so with several short sections, beginning in verse 7 all the way through 18 of Colossians chapter 4. He mentions 12 specific people, 11 men, one woman, who in these verses has come alongside Paul. Remember, Paul did not know the Colossian church personally. Paul is currently, at the time of this writing, in house arrest in Rome. He's about a thousand miles away. And so you've seen in these sections of these individuals and their gifts and these things that it takes all of us to build God's kingdom. We need each other. Leaders are only as effective as those around them. And no one modeled that better than the Apostle Paul in the Bible. Ministry in life is so much about doing life with Christ forever. We need each other. Batman needed Robin. Han Solo needed Chewbacca. Peanut butter needs chocolate. Everything <laughs> needs bacon, right? We need each other. It is this section that reminds us this simple truth that ordinary people can make an extraordinary difference. And you and I have the privilege of loving and meeting these people one day in glory. A reminder that God uses the gifts of ordinary servants who faithfully give other talents 
to fulfill his work. And so that is why Paul has given us in verses 7 through 18, the faithfulness of Tychicus and Onesimus, the resolve and loyalty of Aristarchus, the ability to move on and through the grace of God seen by John Mark, the righteous character of Jesus' justice, the steadfast intentionality and resolve of prayer and a desire to know the will of God in Epaphras, and finally the ability to use one's gifts inside the church and outside the church in Luke. It is within this setting that Paul ends the book of Colossians. And we're gonna study today, verses 15 and 18, that Christ is enough. Now, before we study these last four verses of Colossians, uh, as your pastor, there's just some things that I need to know that you know about the book of Colossians. So one of my favorite New Testament scholars is a man by the name of F.F. Bruce. He's gone on to be with the Lord and just a brilliant man. But he tells us the story of how this pastor of this large church brought him in to do a study of the book of Ephesians. And he was just so proud of, of this study. And he was writing a book on Ephesians. And to F.F. Bruce's amazement, that when he began to lead this study among the church, they didn't know who wrote the book of Ephesians. And so as your pastor, you and I are going to be in glory one day, and you're going to meet the Apostle Paul, and you're going to say, hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so, who are you? And you say, well, I'm the Apostle Paul, and I don't want you to say, oh, what did you do? <laughs> I'm going to want to continue a conversation that will last all of eternity of the books and the magnanimity of such a man. So who wrote the book of Colossians? The Apostle Paul, praise God. Now, who was Paul? Paul is not only the primary writer of the book of Colossians, he is arguably the most influential Christian of all time. He was of Jewish ancestry, but was also a Roman citizen. He was educated theologically in the Hebrew under a man named Gamaliel. Arguably, no man can match his intellectual acuity. There is no greater theological mind that you and I have ever been exposed to. He was a Hebrew of Hebrew. Pharisee of Pharisees. He had the equivalent of two PhDs by the time he was 21 years old. He had a black belt in Kung Fu. You know what I mean. This man was awesome. He is one of God's greatest gifts to us. And he wrote 13 books in the New Testament. Now amazingly, Paul had never been to Colossae. He'd never seen this region of what the Lord was doing here. And it wasn't Paul, but a man by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras began as a native of Colossae and a founder of this church, traveled a thousand miles from Colossae in the Lycus Valley to Rome. And he began to detail to Paul what was happening within the church. Epaphras was a sacrificial man, a, a tireless worker. According to Colossians 4, verses 12 through 13, he was a relentless prayer warrior. For those of you who are leaders in our church, Leaders of organizations, coaches, CEOs, teachers, administrators, owners of your own company, see Epaphras. Epaphras' work ethic, Epaphras' way of life, he is a man that is to be imitated. And it was Epaphras who notified Paul of what was going on in the Lycus Valley. That what was happening in Laodicea and Heropolis and Colossae, the tri-city area, and what Christ was doing there. Now, who brought the letter to Colossae? Now, Colossae is 100 miles from Ephesus. It is currently located right now in the southern part of Asia, modern-day Turkey. And according to Colossians 4, 7 through 9, Paul had entrusted Tychicus and Onesimus to travel the strenuous thousand-mile journey from now Rome to Colossae. More than likely, they also had the letter of Ephesians and the letter of Philemon along with the letter of Colossians. It was a, an incredible, strenuous journey. If it wasn't for the faithfulness of these men, we would not have Ephesians and Philemon and Colossians. Thirdly, what was the primary concern of Colossians? Colossians is a book that is dominated that is centered upon the absolute supremacy of Christ over all things. Christ is all. He's not only above, he is all. 
He is the preeminent of all things, as head of creation and his church. All you need then is Christ. You see, Christ's followers in Colossae were in danger of being infiltrated by false teachers, philosophy, specifically Gnosticism. In what is known as the Colossian heresy, there were Gnostics in Paul's day, false teachers who claimed that salvation in Christ was not enough. That in order for you truly to be enlightened by God, you needed knowledge. That Jesus could not be God because Jesus was a man. And all matter is evil according to the Gnostics. So therefore, you can place your faith in him, but to truly have righteousness from God, you must obtain knowledge. One that is necessary unto faith. That Jesus is not God. Jesus is an emanation, a partial, partial revelation of God. It is these truths that Paul begins to, in one of the most stunning masterpieces of the entire New Testament, detail to us the answers of what it is, of who Christ is, and what it means to follow him through the book of Colossians. And so as we wrap this book up, before we study verses 15 and 18, I want to give you four things. Four things that we can learn from the book of Colossians. Number one, the gospel of Christ is God's guarantee of everlasting hope to us. Paul spells hope, J-E-S-U-S. He starts this book in Colossians 1.5 with a prayer. And in his prayer, he says in verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, Of this you have heard before and in the word of truth, the gospel. Hope to Paul is a confident expectation of what is to come because you and I upon faith have the assurance of Christ in us. To Paul, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Everlasting hope is not an idea. It's not a novelty. It is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the assurance of hope that is provided by Christ is empowered through Christ by the gospel. That is why every single day of your life, you must preach the gospel to yourself. That when you wake up in the morning, you must say, Lord Jesus, I'm alive. The sun's out, thus the sun is on his throne. And I've got a heartbeat and you're reigning over that heart. Thus may everything I do today be for you. That in every time that you receive bad news, you must preach to yourself the good news. Lord, this news does not define me. You do. Lord, my identity is not in this shortcoming, not in my work or performance, but in the performance of Christ on my behalf. Father, this blessing is just an overflow of your goodness, but it is not my greatest treasure. Christ is. Lord, I'm headed to this job. I'm headed to this school. I'm doing this assignment. But my position and title is not who I am. I'm a Christ follower. The greatest designation I've ever been given is a son and daughter of the living king of the universe. And in a bad news world, I'm going to show and share all around me the good news of Jesus Christ. So what then is the gospel? The gospel is the one true God, holy, infinite, sovereign, and sufficient, made us in his image to know him and love him and glorify him. But we, knowing him, did not love him, did not glorify him, for we loved and glorified ourselves. We've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But in his great love, God took upon flesh in Jesus, lived a perfect and sinless life, died a substitutionary death for our sins, was raised and judged victorious from the dead. And now Christ as King calls us to repent, to believe in him for who he is, the sovereign King of the universe, our Savior and Lord. And when we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, we are born again. We are a new creation. It's as if we had never existed previously. 
Our lives are so drastically different because we are no longer dependent upon the flesh, but we are indwelt with his spirit. And thus every day we are transformed in a new spirit-led life in Christ, for we will be with him and love him and glorify him forever. Can't you see now why you and I have a secured everlasting hope? It is this gospel of Christ that is our guarantee of such things. Hope to us is J-E-S-U-S. And we learn this for the book of Colossians. Number two, Christ then is our perfect representation and reflection of God. Paul in an early church hymn in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, states in the beginning of 15, he being Christ is the image of the invisible God. Who is God? Christ. Who is the reflection of God? Christ. Who is the image of God? Christ. For Christ makes the invisible God visible. Jesus Christ is not a lesser emanation. He's not just some better idea toward moralism. No, he's the sovereign king of the universe. He has always existed as Lord. Before the universe was even created, he already was as God. And he took upon flesh. And what was impossible for us in working our way to him, he came to us. Therefore, you and I, humanity, are not the sinner of the world. Christ is. For all things find their sum in him. Therefore, you and I are to be centered on and in and through him. Everywhere we go, everything we see, everyone we meet are under his authority and are meant to love him and glorify him. He is the perfect representation and reflection of God. Therefore, Paul tells us in Colossians 2, eternal life rests on who Christ is and what God has done through Christ. Mark these verses down. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our trespasses. Praise God. How? Verse 14. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Arguably the greatest evangelist besides the Apostle Paul that the world has ever known was a man by the name of Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham, who I actually had the privilege of seeing when he came to Oklahoma City in the early 2000s, probably preached the gospel to over a billion people. And in doing so, hundreds of millions of them accepted Christ. Praise God. But Billy Graham was not only a tremendous evangelist and a wonderful Bible teacher, he also had a hilarious sense of humor. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate Billy Graham the most is, is that he was the same on the platform that he was off the platform. Uh, that he was just as comfortable preaching Jesus to tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people as he was sharing Christ on some pond in North Carolina or wherever else the Lord placed him. And the story goes one time about Billy Graham is, is that he went to a restaurant and he was going to get to the drive through And at the same time that he got there, there was a woman who thought she got there first. And so Billy, not necessarily seeing or thinking he got there first, he cut her off. And she begins to, in the drive through to honk at him over and over and over again. Even when he's trying to order his meal, she began honking at him. Some of you had this experience. I mean, our family would go to Slim Chickens every single Sunday here for the most part. You know, there's always kind of that two-way sense of Slim Chickens on which line am I going to get into, and then who was first, me or you? This is exactly what happened to Billy Graham. So he orders his food, and he's in the drive through lane, and he tells the cashier, you know, I would love to not only pay for my meal, but see this car behind me? I want to pay for her meal, too. And he took off. Well, the lady gets there, still agitated about the situation. And she goes to the man in the cashier, how much do I owe you? He says, well, actually, ma'am, the car in front of you paid for your meal. And instantly, 
Instantly, her countenance changed. Well, that's just the sweetest thing ever. She said, well, can I have my food? And the cashier said, well, I don't have it. He took it. <laughs> and the story goes that Billy Graham was around the corner waiting on this woman with her food. She wouldn't talk to him earlier. She's going to talk to him now. <laughs> and he asked for her forgiveness. And he said, ma'am, I just simply did not see you. This is a misunderstanding. Please forgive me. Can I tell you about a Savior who can forgive your sins as well? And he shared the gospel with her right there. What happens when you place your faith in Christ? What does God do with our sin? The moment that you place your faith in Christ, Paul says that God forgives you in Christ. That as a result of who Christ is and what he has done, that he cancels the record debt of our sin as if it never existed. You see, before Christ, you and I were unredeemed. We were just like these folk that Paul talked about in Colossians 2. The uncircumcised in the Old Testament were enemies of God. It was impossible for us to get to God. And as a result, we were dead in our sin, powerless to overcome it. All we knew was ourselves. But Colossians 2 reminds us that by faith, Christ, as our substitute, pays our debt, takes on our penalty. And upon believing in him, we receive his righteousness. We receive his victory over sin and death. You see, God's acceptance and forgiveness of us is not dependent upon our actions for him, but Christ's actions for us. It is not on what we do, but what Christ has done. Thus then, Paul transitions in Colossians 3 to now what? In light of this theological truth, what are we supposed to do? Jesus then, number four, as Lord, cannot be an additive to our lives, but demands all of our lives. What are we to do in Colossians 3? If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. For he's at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are of the earth. Your wealth and value to the Father isn't based upon what you do or don't do every day, but rather on what Christ is doing through you. True life change then happens when we intentionally direct our minds toward Christ, where it infuses our lives to live for Christ. Lord, this isn't about me, this is about you. Father, I'm going through this hardship right now, but you're either pruning me to refine me because I've already been defined by and in Christ. Lord, I'm continuing to persevere to grow in my faith, not for my own glory, but your glory. You see, what we think about Christ is everything. His burdens become our burdens. His mission is to be our mission. His life is to be our life. It is within this sense that Paul ends the book of Colossians. He gives us 12 individuals from Colossians 4, 7 through 18. 11 men, one amazing woman. Let's meet her right now in Colossians 4. Look at verse 15. And give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that I also read the letter from Laodicea. And see to it that Archippus, see to it that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. And I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Who in the world is Nympha in verse 15? Well, she is probably a widow. 
because her husband is not mentioned in these verses. You see, Nympha lived in Laodicea. It was nine miles from Colossae. And more than likely, the church met in her house. Now, house churches in the New Testament were incredibly common. We studied this when we studied the book of Acts. They were used for both worship and small group gatherings. You've got to remember that historically, it wasn't until the third and fourth century that churches would own property for the sake of worship. But Nympha graciously shared her home for ministry. And Paul recognized her generosity. Are we doing the same? You and I as followers of Christ, we own nothing. We're stewards of everything. Do we have the same intentionality that every gift that God gives us, every possession that God's entrusts to us is a means for ministry? You see, whatever we've been given by God, we should be used for God in ministry. You know, I, I saw this yesterday. I've been hanging out uh, the majority of Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the Oklahoma City area. My oldest son, Major, is participating in the Big Fire National Championships. He's got a chance to be a national champion today. And man, we've been navigating on turf fields this 105, 110 degree heat. And yesterday, it, it got pretty hot in Oklahoma. In fact, they were saying the turf was 113, 114 degrees. Very, very hot. And about the fourth or fifth inning, the pitcher of the other team kind of began to be a little dazed and dehydrated. So the coach of the other team said, time. And so he goes out and he has a bottle of water. He gives this pitcher a drink. And while he called time, the catcher, I've never seen this before in my life, laid on his back on home plate just like this, kind of looking up to the heavens. Can there be any rain today, Lord? Nope, there wasn't. And so he's laying there on the plate, and God's sense of humor, Major, was up to bat. And so Major goes up, and he's checking on this guy. Hey, are you all right? And so he waves to the coach and says, hey, come here. And so the coach, who was giving the pitcher a drink, he brought some water over to the catcher. And the catcher took a drink. Well, there was just a little bit left. And so Major made this motion to the coach, <laughs> And he grabbed this water bottle and he finished it off right there. And we continued to play baseball. And everyone in the stands was just kind of standing in bewilderment. And there was a team from Texas that was right behind us. And they were commenting on who would ever do this. And there was a lady sitting next to him. She said, in Oklahoma, we would. You see, in Oklahoma, we take care of each other. And despite us trying to beat one another, when someone else needs help, we help. You see, that was, that's what was happening in Colossians 4. Nympha, she was this wonderful woman of God. More than likely, her husband had gone on to be with the Lord, and she had a house. And she saw her house as an opportunity to bless someone else for Jesus. You need a place to meet Epaphras, Onesimus, Philemon? Why don't you meet in my house? And let's study the scriptures together. And let's live out the gospel together. And let's change the world together. What is it and who is it this week that God is saying, I've given you so much, you give. You give my gospel. You give my blessing. You give Jesus to them. What a woman. I can't wait to meet her. Now in verse 16, Paul gives us a fascinating historical note. Look at it. He says, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, so specifically the book of Colossians. When it's, when it's read, it, read, read it to all in the area, Heropolis and Laodicea and Colossae. But he also says, see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Do you see this? You see, the letter to Colossians was a circular letter. It was read publicly in congregations throughout the Lycus Valley. Praise God. But there's been a debate for centuries now to the identity of this letter from Laodicea. It could refer to some special letter that has been lost. I do not believe that. I believe that within the cultural setting of this verse, that this letter from Laodicea, are you ready for this? Is the book of Ephesians. That Paul would entrust Tychicus and Onesimus with three letters, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. And as they took these three letters back 
Philemon was a member in the church of Colossae. Colossians was obviously written for those in Colossae, though it would be read in Laodicea and Hierapolis. In this region, Ephesus was about 100 miles away. The spread of the gospel was beginning to permeate that region. They would need the letter of Ephesians to encourage one another in Christ. Speaking of encouragement, look at verse 17. And Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you received in the Lord. Who? Who in the world is this guy? He's only mentioned twice in the entire Bible. Right here in Colossians 4 and in Philemon 2. Which means, are you ready for this? Archippus was probably the son of Philemon. Now we don't know exactly what the ministry assigned to Archippus was. But we know it was of great importance to Paul. That Paul champions to Archippus faithfulness and perseverance. One can translate verse 17 to fulfill in the fullest sense possible the ministry that is entrusted to you. Give your best with all your might to the fullest sense possible, Archippus. You be faithful and persevere to this ministry. When I was thinking of this sense, I, I thought of the, the greatest athlete ever in North America. It's the horse, Secretariat. Greatest race horse of all time. He was the ninth horse to ever win the Triple Crown, and he did so in crushing defeat every time. Track records every time. But on May the 5th, 1973, in front of 134,000 people, Secretariat did something that no horse has ever done. As he was running the Kentucky Derby, he finished every quarter mile faster than the one before. That the longer he ran the race, the faster Secretariat was, a feat that has never been repeated. That the longer he went, the further he went, the faster he went. That is the sense that Paul gives Archippus. That is the charge that God gives us. That God desires us to faithfully finish whatever he starts. Whatever season of life you're in this morning, may you, with all intentionality, faithfully finish what the Lord has started. That may you not coast into glory. But may you ask the Lord, what is it that you have for me? May I maximize these gifts and may I see these opportunities as a way to faithfully finish what it is you're starting. It is within this wonderful setting that Paul ends the book of Colossians by saying, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now, as is custom in the day, Paul would dictate his letters. And so as he began to close this letter, he, he gives his own personal greeting. He uses this same closing in four other letters. It is pointedly here, recognize, pay attention, acknowledge my chains. That though I'm under house arrest, that though I'm confined, I'm not defined by these things. That this imprisonment has not impeded my ministry at all. In fact, in so many ways, it's flourishing. In so many ways, it's expanded. I am meeting royalty. I am chained to Pachurian guards. I am using ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things by the grace and peace of God. And what I give you is the very same thing that God gives me every day. Grace be with you. Paul summarizes the book of Colossians in four words. Amazingly, may God's unmerited favor freely and fully, always rest upon you. 
see, Paul knew more than anybody. It was God's grace alone through Christ alone that sustained his life and his ministry and the churches that he led. It's this same sense that you and I close the study of Colossians, that as a Christ follower, we do an about face because of his grace. Before Christ, our master was sin. That no matter our actions, we were always disappointed, always left unsatisfied, empty. But now, because of Christ, we have been given something more than we could ever imagine. We've been given not only a Savior and a Lord, but a friend. A friend that we have committed to follow faithfully, as he is faithful to us. I end with the illustration of a man by the name of John Newton. A man who for a majority of his life before Christ was confused with religion, was a man who was self-centered, full of greed, slave owner, traitor, and then he met Christ. And as he was reflecting upon God's amazing grace in his life, how that, that God had been so kind to him in his rebellion, that God had rescued him from multiple shipwrecks, that God could forgive him for enslaving other people. In 1772, he wrote a poem that would originally be a fashioned to the greatest hymn of all time, Amazing Grace. Do you remember the first stanza of that hymn? Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You see, before Christ, we were a wretch. Our lives were a mess. We were blind. We were lost but no more. And upon believing in Christ, we have the greatest master the world has ever known. We have the sweetest savior the world has ever known. We have the most faithful friend that the world has ever known. And it is his sustaining grace, his endless joy, his unbridled peace in his everlasting life that you and I live for him as he over and above lives in and through us. His grace is sufficient for Christ is enough. And that is the book of Colossians. Would you bow your head and close your eyes?